Hey everybody, we are now live on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, so welcome, if you are a um, early riser like me, uh, this is a great time to do any type of learning, um, anything like that before the day starts. That's usually what I do, reading, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I have, uh, I've been doing a fitness challenge where um, I get up at 3.40 a.m. To, uh, to do my workout. So we figured since I'm wide awake already, uh, you know, it might be a good time to do a, uh, our live show at 7 a.m. in Singapore, which of course is 7 p.m. if you're on the East Coast. And, um, and of course, you're always welcome to join us because this is a live broadcast. Uh, you can uh, you can chime in. You can uh, write comments. You can uh, say hi, or you can you know ask questions, which is which is always good. And in today's uh, session, what we're going to talk about is trust, and especially the misalignment around trust, because that is what uh, what we're noticing a a you know increasingly growing issue around around trust. Um, and so, uh, and of course, I'm on this uh, show with Kilani, uh, who is uh, always joining me. And uh, and so, Kilani, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We're in different countries again. That's the two different screens that we're on. Um, yeah. But I, I love this conversation around trust, especially around the idea of aligned trust, because uh, something that you touch on a lot is that trust is talked about by almost every if not every leader out there and maybe every person out there too yet the idea of aligning trust is something that takes the idea of trust a step further and really allows us to to create something that we can use to actually build that trust that we talk about a lot yeah yeah and you know what what's interesting for me and and why i talk about you know more about aligning trust than than trust itself is um you know, if you look at all the research out there, you know, that the trust tends to be used as like this blanket statement, right? And and just, you know, when for example, when you look at surveys done, whether it's, you know, from Gallup or any of the, of the other um, organizations, they're all, you know, McKinsey, I think, did one as well. And, and they discover that, you know, in these questionnaires, it's like, it's like a whopping 87% of all leaders think trust is the most important factor in organizational performance. But, but very few people actually kind of say, say, so what is trust? Like what, you know, what is it really? And we all have this assumption that we all think the same thing when we, when we talk about trust. And, and of course, you know, there are, there are 8 billion people and we all have our own way of thinking and our own interpretation. So, so in all likelihood, we probably think something different, you know, for each and every one of us when it comes down to trust. How, how is that for you, Kenan? How have you noticed that? Yeah, I feel, I feel the exact same way, both in my own experience and from speaking with clients is the idea of trust is something that we all, we all want in an ideal world, yet pretty much any article you read any you know any any advice you get from people is just build trust and the question is always how do we do that and a lot of the advice we get is you know throw a pizza party or you know talk talk to your team members but most be be kind right the time most leaders are already doing that yet there's still a disconnect between them and and the people they work with and so that kind of leaves the question of how do we actually create the trust that we want to see in an organization, which is, it's, as you mentioned, it's not quite the idea of trust, but rather what does trust mean to uh, each individual person? And I was actually being interviewed on a podcast earlier today, and he was mentioning there's, there's this model, I forget who created it, but it's, it's some, someone who's in, in the leadership field and it's called the, the five levels of leadership. And uh-huh. it's essentially the top tier of, of leadership is understanding that the uh, even if you're you know the best leader to, to one person, you may not be considered the best leader to another. And I think starting from a point of understanding that kind of opens the doorway to, to learning about a line for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and if I remember correctly, I think the five levels of leadership is from John C. Maxwell. Let me... Um, yes, that's... that's let me, yeah, yeah. yeah let, let, actually, I'm just going to Google that really quickly. Uh, yeah, there's John C. Maxwell. Yeah, so he... he um, 
He wrote the the five levels of trust. Yeah, exactly. And and I remember reading that a long time ago because it's uh, um, but yeah, there there are you know these multiple different levels that um, you know that we need to apply. And and John C. Maxwell Maxwell stuff is used a lot in organizations as well. Um, but yeah, just just the fact that you know trust is such an ambiguous thing. Right, you know, and and yet it is it is so fundamental in any relationship, right? You know, whether whether it's about about teams of people being able to work better together, um, whether whether you're you know an individual contributor in a company, and um, and you need to feel like you can trust your company, right? But it also in families, right? You know, in, in you know spousal relationships, uh, parents. All of these kind of things, you know, we all we all value trust, but we very rarely have a conversation of of you know just asking that simple question of what does trust mean for you, right? You know, what are your criteria to feel like you can be trusted, or what are your criteria to feel like you can trust somebody? And we all have this different expectation. We all have this different standard. It's like a sliding scale. And, and some things are just more important to some people than, you know, than others. Yeah. And, and you know, what comes to mind for me, right, as, as, we're, as we're talking about this, you know, and, and of course, you know, a lot of the work that we do, um, you know, that conversation of trust is, is so fundamental, right? It's so important. And so, so you know, th and that's why we ask that question, right? Because we're, we're working with our leaders. And, and, uh, and I remember running a workshop a while back and a few years ago. And, uh, and, and there was this team that was like a newly formed team. And I asked them, I said, so, you know, on a sliding scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, right? Where would you rank your trust for each other as a team? And right away, everybody was like, well, we're at least an eight, right? We're at least an eight with regards to that we trust each other. And I'm like, oh, how so? And he was like, well, you know, it's like we're, we're, we're always having, you know, candid conversations and we're always having, you know, kind of all of these kind of things. We work really well together. And so, and so as, I, as I started you know, asking some deeper questions, I thought, you know, I'm going to do an exercise with each of them. And, um, and the person who was most adamant in this team about how everybody trusts each other, right, was, was the one that I was paying attention to most, right? Because, because everybody else on the team was kind of like, yeah, well, we trust each other. <laughs> You know, but uh, but it was it was a different enthusiasm. You know, and then this one guy's like, "Oh yeah, we're like totally trust each other, right?" And uh, and so I asked them to do an, an exercise with each other, where where they sat together and and made a declaration to each other that they were prepared to be one hundred percent vulnerable with each other. And so and so the way that I did the exercise is I as I said, okay, so my name is so and so, right? And, and I commit here and there that from now on, I, I, I um, in, intend to be completely and unconditionally vulnerable with you. And every team member struggled to say that they were prepared to be vulnerable with the other person. And right away, people started asking questions, say, but we can't be vulnerable. You know, because if I'm if I'm vulnerable, like what is that going to mean? Like like, am I going to show my worst self? But if I show my worst self, that's gonna that's gonna show up poorly on my on my performance review, and then I'm not going to get promoted, and then I'm gonna. Yeah. So right away, there are all of these types of questions for people. Like, I can't be vulnerable with another human being, and so and so you know, as as they were in this exercise, they started to learn that. That, you know, in order for them to be able to trust each other, they also need to be able to trust that they have each other's backs. And, and that means that they have each other's backs even when things don't go well. And I, even, I may even say, especially when things don't go well, right? Especially when you're making a mistake, especially when you feel you need to ask for help, you know, and that's a vulnerable state. Trusting another person is the highest source of vulnerability,
because you're 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 counting on that other person to have your back no matter what in the future right you know and um and that's that's a big step and so when when everybody started to realize that hey there's going to be some flexing required for me to really fully want to be vulnerable with you. The score went from an eight to a three. And the team discovered that they thought they trusted each other, but in reality, they didn't. What they, what they, what they thought trust was, was what I, what I like to call predictability trust. And that's that ability to be able to predict that somebody, you know, if somebody says they're going to do something, that they're going to do it, right? It's like, you can, you can, tr you know, it's like, can I trust that you're going to do this task, right? Can I trust that you're going to um, have, have this report ready by tomorrow, 5 p.m., right? But that's not what trust is. That's just being able to count on something being done. That's the ability or the desire to predict a future behavior. And that's not trust, right? You know, is can I, can I trust you to ask for help? Can I trust you to share your opinion with me even if we don't agree with each other? Can I trust you to hold me accountable if I'm, if I'm not pulling my weight? And can you trust me that I'm going to support you in that trust? Right, you know, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> different conversation. Right, you know, and and so and so what I've what I've learned over the years is that you know one of the fundamental questions that leaders need to be asking their people is not can I trust you, but really what is your understanding of trust? What does trust mean for you? Right, and and once we know from each other what real trust really means for each other, and we have a conversation about it, we can start aligning each other's criteria of what is important to us in that trusting realm you know and that's and i think that's that's so fundamental yeah kenani do you have do you have any examples of where you've seen you know kind of trust being misaligned yeah definitely i think in in most relationships at some point or another there is a form of, of misaligned trust and i think that that vulnerability piece plays plays a key role um, because I think you're right a lot of people do mistake the idea of trust for just oh I, I know that they'll be there I know they'll do what they're gonna do I know that they'll, they'll be they'll hold themselves accountable right but to be able to actually mess up in front of people and to show people your flaws and to admit that you don't know everything that you're not an expert in the room um, and to trust that they're going to be there to support you and to help you where, where you may not be an expert is what trust really is. And I think that that's really powerful because being able to, to come from that place of, of kind of like a not knowing, being able to, to, to create my, my cat just came and sat on my lap. Um, oh, <laughs> hey, Blue. Oh, Blue. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, um, she wants attention, but. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think being able to come from from that place of you know not needing to be an expert and not knowing everything just gives other people space to show you uh, their their i get your ability to trust them i guess mm -hmm. um and i was actually reading the article that you sent me earlier on, on the neuroscience of trust and that it's the level of oxytocin that, that mm -hmm. we create that allows us to trust other people um mm -hmm. and one thing i found interesting in that article is uh, the, the main researcher was explaining his experience with trust. And he said in his leadership role, he was trying to to come from that place of not being the expert and admitting to when he doesn't know things. And to his surprise, he thought, you know, same thing. I wouldn't get a promotion. I was going to get fired. People would lose trust in me. But what it did was actually build his credibility. And I think at the end of the day, people want to work with people. They don't want to work with a machine who's unflawed because that's that's terrifying, right? It's good to go to someone who's your superior to talk to them about something very human and to feel that they're not human in return um, can be can be a break in trust in itself. 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. And you know, that actually reminds me just recently, just, just about a week ago, I, I had a similar type conversation with a leader and, 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 and I, and I call it, I call it the, 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 the superhero syndrome, right? You know, is where, is where a lot of leaders think that they need to be a superhero, like a superhero, right? Where, where they're the saviors of the day. And, you know, they're, they're the ones with, you know, all of the, the knowledge and all of the experience and all of the wisdom and that that weight of responsibility sits on their shoulders alone and um and and there are there are plenty of leaders out there who love that right who love being the superhero figure and um and what they what they don't understand is that you know a lot of people can't relate with a superhero because there are a lot of people out there who don't think they're a superhero and um and you know part of being a superhero of course is that you're bulletproof all right you know and because uh, most pe most superheroes are bulletproof and um and so and so what you know what these superhero leaders do is they they present themselves as if they are this you know bulletproof human being um you know who who can save the day and um, and what that actually does is number one is it, it creates a tremendous misalignment right Be between the people who think they're human <laughs> right you know and just want to work for a human and and this this person who's the leader and, and wants to be the superhero for everybody and it all comes from a beautiful place it comes from a place of care it comes from a place of you know a desire to want to do good and and, and enthusiasm and excitement and all of these kind of things but just that misalignment by putting themselves on this kind of, you know, superhero pedestal, um, you know, they, they uh, you know, basically already create this misalignment because nobody is going to come to a, you know, go up to a superhero and tell them about how they feel they are flawed, how they feel that they are making mistakes because they see the superhero who's, who's flawless, right? You know, and you're not going to have a, have a conversation about your flaws with somebody that you see you know, is, is potentially flawless. And, and so that then creates this misalignment. The, the downside about that superhero syndrome is, is that it also creates enablement, right? Because, because um, people start trusting <coughs> that you're gonna save the day. And so, and so they're gonna, <coughs> sorry, they're gonna gladly give you permission to take the, the weight of the world on your shoulders because if you do it, they don't have to do it. All right. And so and so when when people aren't aren't lifting in in you know in, in their capacity, they're not growing. They're not developing as human beings and as future leaders. So in a way, you're doing your organization and your team a disservice if you feel that all of this responsibility needs to be on you and on you alone. Right, you know, and um, and and one of the greatest ways of of removing that, right, of doing it, is is to to remove that, you know, that that cape, that superhero cape that you wear, and put it put it in the closet, leave it at home, right, you know, and and come to work as a, as a flawed human being, someone who doesn't know everything, somebody who who is okay, not being okay. Right? Who's, who's okay not knowing everything? Who's okay making, um, you know, mistakes? Uh, and, uh, oh, wait, I got, a, I got a great comment here. I'm actually going to put that up here, right, from uh, Mohammed, right? He says, uh, yes, and many leaders understand the value of trust. However, how do you achieve trust without turning it into a metric that you need to hit, therefore making it seem like a forced trust? Love that. Yeah, what a what a great comment. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, and I and I totally agree. It's it's like, you know, um, trust is often a metric. If you look at uh, um, you know three hundred and sixty feedbacks, for example, right? You know, trust is an element in in most companies three hundred and sixty feedback that leaders do as um, you know as part of their performance review. So they have to hit a certain certain metric of trust. And um, and because of that, it has actually become more of a um, you know kind of a superficial thing of like a, a metric that they need to hit. It's a KPI rather than you know rather than something that they can be living every single day, right? So uh, so way to go, Mohammed. I I whole, wholeheartedly agree. Is uh, you know is is and 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 I think too is that 
very often, um, again, you know, it's, it's, if you look at these questionnaires, you know, they, they take trust as a blanket statement and they say, hey, what's your level of trust for this leader? And, and as people are giving this feedback, but, but there's never a question in there on how vulnerable are you prepared to be with your leader, right? How comfortable are you talking to your leader about your problems? You know, none of that stuff's in a um, in, 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 in the questionnaire. It really is just a blanket statement. And as long as a person is scoring at least a three out of five on that trust. And so, and so with trust being such an ambiguous statement, a lot of people think, well, yeah, I can trust my leader. I'm going to trust my leader to, you know, um, to be a dick. I can trust my leader to be an asshole. I can trust my, right. You know, I mean, there's, 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 there's so many ways in which we can, we can trust predictive behavior. I can trust that my boss is going to behave a certain way. Um, even though that's behavior I don't like, I can still trust that he's going to do that. That's not what trust is. It's just prediction, right? You know, and so, and so, you know, breaking that down into, into a much, um, you know, a much, a much more kind of defined level of what is truly that understanding of trust and what are we looking for in this realm of trust yeah so so wonderful thank you thank you Mohammed. yeah yeah and um yeah and you know in in thinking about that too right is is you know when when we just look at trust it's not even not even just from a from a team perspective but you know even even organizationally Right. You know, if you're if you're looking at your, you know, the a, a senior leadership team of an organization, very often, um, you know, when I ask senior leaders, you know, C, especially in the C-suites and, and, and then around on that level um, and I ask them, you know, kind of how do you feel about trust? Nine out of 10 of them say trust is great. We have such so much trust in our organization. It is wonderful. Right. You know, it's like everybody trusts each other. But then as you start talking to people, you know, layers down, you start, you start noticing that there's this tremendous misalignment between how people actually at ground level feel about trust and the trust that senior leaders think they have, even if they have these metrics in place and even if they're doing these questionnaires. Because often people, you know, the problem with trust is that when I, when I don't trust that you're going to take feedback really well. I'm not going to give you honest and vulnerable feedback. I'm not going to say to you, you know, I don't think I don't think you're doing too well on this department, right? And so and so what I'm going to end up doing is I'm just going to give you a score that you want to see. I'm saying, "Yeah, you're fine." Right? You know, and we and we know that too from from asking for feedback. Right. If 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 I were if I were a leader in an organization and I just walk around and I ask people say, hey, you know, on a scale of one to ten, you know, what's your trust for me? Right. The majority of people can say, dude, it's an eight. Yeah. Now you're doing good. But but inside, you know, they might be feeling very different things, but they're not going to tell me because they don't trust me. That's the downside is that if there is no trust. People are not going to give you an honest answer. They're just going to say it's good. It's like if your if your boss, for example, is somebody who's really aggressive and and you know and really kind of always pushes their ideas and their thoughts. How you know how difficult is it to be able to give that person feedback and say, dude, you know, I mean, I'm you know, it's it, it's great that you're so passionate, but you got to give other people space to you know to breathe and 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 think. And, you know, and the way that you're operating is not giving us that space. And, and, it's, and, and we're feeling a little overwhelmed when, you know, especially in meetings and things like that. Never happens, right? Yeah. So, um, oh, and so Mohammed just came back. I love one. A great question. Um, is there a link between certain leadership styles with higher levels of trust? What do you think, Annie? Is there a link between certain leadership styles with higher levels of trust? Yeah. I think, I think there would be definitely a link between, between having a different leadership style with a different level of trust. And, and I think really, if we're, we're looking at trust and, and the reason I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this is because I think it really depends on, again, what we're seeing trust as. 
Uh -huh. um, and one thing that I wanted to, to bring up as well to kind of loop into this is that by me metricizing, metricizing, I'm not sure if that's a word, but we're going to coin the term, um, a very people focused behavior, which is trust, we're, we're turning our people focus into a task focus. And so I think your ability to be a leader and to show up with a certain leadership style is really going to depend on whether your focus really is on people and, and therefore your, your ability to connect and trust with one individual person and then the next individual person, rather than just creating this blanket culture of, of you know, the pizza party trust where we're just kind of mm. throwing on things, trying to, trying to create that, that culture of trust. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're more task focused, that's definitely going to show up um, with a different leadership style as well. Mm, yeah. So, um, so, so, and, and I think, I think Damon, um, you know, said it a well, so, so I just uh, put, put it up. Damon, Damon said, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, if you, if you look at it via a behavioral style, then yes. And I think, I think Damon, if, if I, if I may, may add to that, I think what you're meaning is that if you're, if you're as a leader, if you're looking at the behavioral style that the person that you're leading needs and you adapt your behavior to match that, you know, that need, that behavioral style, right? So you be, so you make your leadership more what we call situational. So it's situational leadership. You look at each situation and you, and you adapt to to meet that that person's need um yeah you're absolutely spot on it's it's you know and what that what that means is that you know as as leaders it's not it's not a singular leadership style that's going to build trust because every single one of your people has a different sensitivity towards trust they have a different meaning and a different need as well um as it comes to to what they need to feel like they can trust you. And so, so if you, if you understand that of every one of your people and every person that you work with and including with your upline or downline, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be able to adjust to that. And that's, and that's something that I mentioned in my book, right? You know, so, so behind me, you can see, see, you know, the, the five energies of horrible bosses is written with that exact thing in mind is, is that, um, that you're, you're, you, there, there's a certain energy that we project when we are collaborating and communicating with people and understanding that each person has this different energy sensitivity. And when we can adjust our energy to match the energy of what people need, then we can start creating connection that, that helps us start building trust, right? You know, so Damon actually just, just added to this, uh, uh, yeah, so he said leaders often need to stretch more than others. Absolutely, right? You know, is is you know leaders you know and 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 a, and a great example of this is DISC, right? So the DISC assessment, the DISC style, and and you know we we know and you know MBTI and all of these as well is like the we all know that we have these various different styles of operating. And, and I like to use DISC as an example is, you know, when, if, you have a, if you have a D style, which is very dominant, or you have an I style, which is more kind of like that, you know, they, they call it influential, but it's, you know, that is that person who's, who's lighthearted and, you know, enjoys, you know, connecting with people and all that stuff. Or you have the S style, which are more, more you know, in, enjoy stability. And you have the C style, which is really conscientiousness, right, about, you know, being being process driven and, and oriented and all of those kind of things. Um, and, and what we, what we know from, from, you know, cause both you and I, you know, Kinani are, are practitioners in DISC. And what we often see in these DISC assessments is that, you know, people, people stay kind of within their top two letters, right. You know, and they, they might be, you know, they might be a D and an I or, a, or, a, you know, D and a C or, you know, there might be an S and a C or an S and an I, and then they stay in that realm, you know, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're not stretching themselves into, into these other letters of disc. They're not practicing how these, how, how to, how to act and, and how to behave with people of these other disc profiles. Right. You know, so um, so that's really important. Um, yeah. And uh, and absolutely, Damon, um, you know, and, and a predictive index uh, definitely does uh, 
does help as well. Yeah. So and and there are so many, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Enneagram and you you, you name it. So. Uh, um, but I, one of the reasons why I like I like to use DISC simply is it's it's simplicity, you know. And and when I'm working with clients, I just it just having having something very very simple to work with is 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 super easy. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. Uh, and and actually, um, DISC as also has an EQ um, component. They have an EQ assessment now as well, which is which is really cool. But uh, but yeah, there there are so many great. Um, you know elements to trust as as you're seeing from damon right you know is is the ability to uh you know because because it takes tremendous emotional intelligence you know to be able to adapt to um to another person right and to be able to kind of you know walk in their shoes and and understand where they're coming from and and to be able to match them where they are and so and so that's why that's why eq is such an important component of any of this without 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 flexing the eq muscle because eq is a skill without flexing that eq muscle um there there never is going to be trust right that is so fundamental i i wholeheartedly agree thank thanks damon that was that's awesome yeah and um and yeah so so as you can see there are so many elements to one single word, right? The word trust, and um, and and how much that can mean, and how different it can be for so many different people. You know, if you're if you're if you just appreciate tasks, and you know, you might be really happy with just just the kind of the that that um, you know predictability trust, right? Of just understanding and predicting people. But on the other hand, you know is um is is that eq component oh okay um damon had another great question he says where is the best starting points to beginning this journey what do you think you know, that's a great question love it thank you damon. Th thank you for your uh, engagement by the way uh, and damon and mohammed love this right so uh so yeah i can do this all day thanks unfortunately we don't have that time but <laughs> i'm gonna i can love it but Kinani, what what would you um answer to uh, to damon's question yeah, that is a great question. And, and thank you, Damon, Damon and Mohammed as well for, for all the engagement and questions. There have been a lot of great ones today. And it's always it's, it's an exciting point for both of us to have these conversations. So we always love to hear your questions. I would say, in my opinion, the best starting point to beginning this journey is from a point of self-awareness. And I think that that's always my answer for a starting point of anything is to really take a look at yourself, your habits, your behaviors, how have things been going for you, both from your perspective and also if you want to take it a step further to think of it from anyone else's perspective that you may be working with in, in whatever relationship you're you're looking at here and to think, you know, what what would they think of me? Or if there was an outside mm. person watching this interaction, what, what would their feedback to me be? Mm. And the reason I say that starting with that self-awareness point is so important is because one, of course, it's going to help you understand where you are. But it's also going to help you understand where you may not be happy with your results or where you may want to change some things, um, which then, of course, from there, as, as you have mentioned, Damon, there are tons of opportunities to uh, tons of resources to, to, to dive into in order to make those changes. Yeah, um, I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think it all it all starts with self-awareness and self-awareness, um, of course, is, you know, is is through assessments and things like that, we can, we can, we can definitely build a lot more awareness around that. Um, but it also reminds me of Daniel Coleman's, right? Like emotional intelligence scale, right? You know, and, and, you know, the, 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 the layers of, of emotional intelligence, right? Which is, which is, you know, that starting at that self-awareness of being aware is, is critical, but then there's that self-regulation emo component, right? Where, where we need to, which is that second level, is that ability to be able to regulate ourselves that we don't just have, you know, these natural knee-jerk tendencies and just kind of want to do things our own way because it's easier, right? But to really be able to regulate that impulse is, is critical. And having the capacity to do that, and I think that is so important too, and, and thank you, Damon, for bringing that to my attention, is that, you know, at, at, at 
you know, there is a, there's a tremendous link between emotional intelligence and capacity, energy capacity. And what I mean with that is that if you look at things, for example, as like stress, right? Like work stress, um, you know, work stress immediately and, and directly reduces emotional intelligence because the more stressed we feel, the more survival oriented we become. And so, so what ends up happening is that from a neuroscience standpoint, the brain actually starts reducing resources in the prefrontal cortex and brings, brings the blood flow and, and, the, and, the, and the neurological um, firing, right, increases in, in the, the primal areas of the brain that are, that, are, that are necessary for survival. So if we are in an environment, right, in a work environment that is of high stress, right, in all likelihood, we're going to be reducing the level of emotional intelligence in our people as a culture. And the moment that that re um, emotional intelligence reduces, we're not going to be prepared to be vulnerable with each other anymore. And so, and so, a you know, an immediate you know result of that is the reduction in um, in trust. Right. You know, so so note how these things are so intricately linked. So so as I'm as I'm talking about self-awareness, I'm I'm also kind of thinking maybe maybe Damon, another great place to start is with capacity. Right. Is understanding that um, that the human brain runs on energy and 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 the 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 energy surplus that's required for us to be able to override an animalistic impulse of self-survival is is tremendous in a high stress environment and so and so you know self care is is equally important that means you know like so for example this morning i was up at 3:40 in the morning um you know going for my workout uh you know so so you know taking care of yourself right you know sleeping on time and that's my second book my first book which is headstrong performance which is which is really around building that mental capacity in your brain so that you can show up as the leader that you want to be so that you can show up you know to to be vulnerable and um and to be open and to be human you know with other people and without that capacity we can't do so and that and there's been a lot of research around the link between capacity and leadership capacity right and um and it's and it's clear that uh, great research from um uh, an organization called CCL, which is the Center of Creative Leadership, and they've done tremendous research on the link between between self care and uh, and 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 leadership, right, and leadership capacity. And what they discovered is that leaders who take care of themselves have greater capacity to apply themselves in a in a way that is more vulnerable and and, lead. and so they are actually trusted. Um, and I think it's a. I think they they just by taking care of themselves, they already seem twenty percent more trustworthy to their people than people who don't work, than leaders who don't work out and don't take care of themselves. So if you're the type of leader and you're in charge, and you're and you're you know and you feel like it's um, it's a good idea just you know to 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 maybe you know skip your workout today or or not eat eat lunch or you know whatever that that might be reducing capacity in your brain think about the effect that it's going to have on your capacity to be the most effective leader that you can be and um, and and the, re the reduction in energy in your brain that's going to come from that. So not just your performance is going to reduce, but also your team's performance is going to reduce simply because you're choosing to prioritize something else other than taking care of yourself, right? So that's, that's why self-care is, is also equally important in that emotional intelligence uh, component. So, uh, so yeah, so as you can see, huge topic, trust, right? You know, we can talk about trust for days. And, um, uh, and so, and so, and I wish, I wish we could, but we are pretty much out of time. Um, uh, let me just get, yeah, I love that. So, um, you know, it, it, yeah, exactly. Um, Damon was saying that, you know, back in the day, and I remember this still, you know, back in the 19s and the early 2000s, basically until 2008, right, which is which was the crash, the big crash before 2008, 
the, the corporate world had this way of functioning um, where where it was all just kind of like, you know, there was a lot of that belief of, yeah, hey, this is the way we do things, right? This is the way the world works and we're happy with it and we're making money and that's good. And then 2008 happened with a big crash and, you know, tons of people, of course, lost their jobs and there was a big disruption that actually came from that. And, um, and people had to start rethinking how to run an organization on a much smaller workforce. And that's when people started you know, needing to do you know, multiple, not multiple job functions, for example. Very rarely will you hear of somebody today who has only one job function. You know, now they have like three or four of them. And the reason is because there was such a reduction in, in workforce, we had to, you know, the whole, the whole, you know, kind of lean management, right, was, was, you know, um, came out of that whole 2008, uh, you know, process. And, and in my opinion, for the better, right, you know, and I remember back, back then, you know, in 2010, I was running a lot of workshops on, um, you know, on, on how to learn to work differently and, and on resilience, right, mental resilience and building, building that mental capacity so that you can do multiple jobs at the same time, um, you know, because uh, organizations already started to see and say, hey, we're going to be stretching our people pretty thin and, and we got to we got to give them that that ability to be able to do so. So. Um, so, yeah, for sure. And um, and and things have changed again, of course, with COVID. Right. You know, so so now we're seeing another disruption. So, you know, a big a big learning for me is that there is no such thing as, you know, this is how we do things. Things are always changing. And and the only the only way we are going to be able to um, prepare for the inevitable changes that are going to come in the in inevitable disruptions that are going to come in the future is is if we flex that muscle right of adaptability and agility and um, and that is one of the most important muscles that an organization is going to need to keep flexing in order for you know even in times of you know peace and quiet we need to keep practicing because if we don't flex it we lose it and that same thing counts for organizations always keep flexing the muscle of agility agility and adaptability and um, and that's going to that's going to help us with also the agility as a leader of being able to adapt to these various different situations and different styles. So, uh, so yeah, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's big. Kina, do you have anything to add to that? Nothing in particular. I have one quote that I read the other day that I, I wanted to bring up because I thought it was really powerful. Um, and, and it's the idea that the, the difference between having a task focused approach and a people focused approach, um, mm -hmm. And the article is basically saying that, that the key to strong leadership is having um, a bit of both, having a good balance of both. And the quote was, your people can't succeed unless you're focused on the results and you can't succeed unless you're focused on the people. Hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a great one. Yeah. So if you're focusing on the people and, and, and in a way that allows them to focus on the tasks, well, it's, gonna yeah, be, it's basically saying that you need to focus on the tasks in order to help your people succeed, but you also need to be focused on the people in order for you to be able to. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so it's, not, it's not either being task-focused or people-focused. It's the ability to do both. And I think that is one of the things that sets great leaders aside from maybe the not-so-great ones. Right, is that that great leaders have that ability to be both people and task focused at, at an e equal amount, and, and and having that agility and adaptability to be able to swing from one to the other wherever needed. Awesome. Well, uh, you, you know, uh, Mohammed, uh, it was absolutely our pleasure. Um, so, and thank you for the thank you. Um, yeah. So, love the topic. Um, and of course, if you have any. Um, you know, topics that you want to mention in the future, just uh, just make a comment or shoot us a message and uh, and we'd be happy to to address that in the future as well. Damon, thank you also so much for uh, for chiming in. Love this. Um, and I think it's uh, it's time for us to log off. You can any any last uh, any last words? Nope. Just to thank you to both Mohammed and Damon and anyone else who, who hopped on to, to watch or leave a comment. We always appreciate the engagement and, and the eyes on, on our stuff as well. Absolutely. And great stuff, everybody. And uh, I look forward to our next session next week. All right. So see you then and uh, and have a great, uh, great day and great week, everybody. See ya. Bye. Bye.